Sounds like work. No, tell them I'm in my chair. The Courier finds yeah, actor Benedict me. Cumberbatch as businessman Gravel Wynn. He's approached by intelligence agencies to spy on the Soviets during the Cuban Missile Crisis. While James Bond and Jason Bourne are action heroes, Gravel Wynn is a different kind of agent. He's described as a, quote, boring civilian that nobody would suspect of ever being a spy. And according to critics, this is what makes the film unique among current espionage films. Gone are the overly lit sets and big action scenes that we see in today's movies. Instead, the courier reaches back to the grassroots of espionage fiction. It has a darkly lit atmosphere. It also has a hero with a low-key appearance, who wears a fedora hat and a long coat. Reviews champion Cumberbatch's performance as a nervy one that drives the film. And this acclaimed performance is based on the real-life exploits of Gravel Wynn, who lived long enough to write two books on his intelligence work. In his real job as an engineer, he traveled frequently to Eastern Europe. This made him the best candidate for spy work. And for MI5, he made several trips to Moscow. And the well-received cinematic outing of Wynn's exploits show one thing. Espionage cinema does not necessarily need mega-budgets and big-sized guns to attract attention. It seems fedora hats and dark rooms never go out of fashion. Let's bring in film critic Hope Madden. Hi there, it's, it's lovely to have you with us today. So, Thank you. Do you agree with what our producer Ali John just said? Is this movie, you think, strong enough to prove that espionage cinema doesn't necessarily need mega budgets and big sized guns to attract attention? You know, I, I think that there's something to that argument. You know, there's something, especially because the film is based on true events. I think people are always fascinated by these really wild stories from their own history that they didn't know about. And, and I also think that people are always really engaged in an everyman kind of a story where some just, you know, guy off the street is plucked into this world that none of us ever thought that we could be involved in. It makes you feel like it could happen to you as well. Um, and so I, I do think that there's something to the idea that people are still interested in films like that, you know, even if they don't have sort of the, the budget and, and the kind of false lighting and big explosions of like your Mission Impossibles. Okay, why are we seeing a lot of these films with, you know, just like you said, overly lit sets and, you know, big guns? Why is this the trend now in espionage cinema? Oh, I just think that, um, you know, especially right now, as, as uh, <clears throat> we're struggling to get people back into theaters proper, I, I think that the reality is that the movies that make the most money are the movies that cost the most money. So, you know, if, if it's the superhero films or if it's the, you know, Fast and the Furious films, I think the um, espionage thrillers, they just follow suit and they make the biggest explosions and the wildest movies and the biggest event pictures, just like kind of all the other genres are doing. Okay, and does this excite you? I mean, uh, what do you think about today's spy movies? You know, I really like the idea of... <clears throat> of telling more of an everyman story. I think this, you know, it makes you think of of uh, imitation games, right? Um, Benedict Cumberbatch, other spy thriller or Bridge of Spies, you know, really high quality films that get you thinking. And I think that you become more invested in than you do in something like Mission Impossible, which I think is a very fun movie. I think the Bourne movies are very fun movies. Uh, but I think that given the, you know, the serious nature of this kind of a film, something a little bit more dialed down like Tinker, Taylor, Soldier, Spy, I think that's always going to have an audience. Mm -hmm. and, um, and do you think will we have more, you know, such classic style espionage films that bring an alternative to, you know, James Bond and Bourne movies? Yeah, you know, I love the question and I hope so. It doesn't. It doesn't look very promising, though. Um, if you look ahead at the, the slate of films that are supposed to come out for the next couple of years, you know, 
you don't see any. There are none on there. Um, and but the other problem is it. So we had two back to back films like this. True stories, uh, you know, espionage thrillers come out of England, The Courier, and also Six Minutes to Midnight. Um, the Courier has been out for about a month. It's made a total worldwide of seven million dollars, and Six Minutes to Midnight made less than half a million dollars. And you can't hold that against it entirely in this particular year because they were only released theatrically, and very few people are going to theaters. But but still, the the really weak box office turnout doesn't kind of speak well to the the possibilities for film like this. Mm -hmm. And okay, coming back to Korea, would you say that it is an A? list spy thriller. I wonder what your overall take on the movie is. You know, I enjoyed it. I don't think it is an A-list spy thriller. I think it keeps your attention the whole time. I think Benedict Cumberbatch uh, and Mirab Nainez are great in it, and they, they generate a kind of camaraderie and a sort of a relationship that I think you don't expect in a film like this. But on the whole, I, I think it kind of lacked that um, ticking time bomb kind of urgency that you expect from a film like this. So, I mean, I thought it was a good movie, but I didn't think it was a great movie. What would make it great? Um, you know, I think that it, it kind of lacked in style a little bit. If you watch Bridge of Spies or even Imitation Game, you there was this felt like a very solidly but not uh, not sort of expertly crafted kind of a film. I think that also it felt a little bit off balance in that I think what it was really trying to do was to direct your attention to this relationship between these two people and, and also between, I think, uh, Greville's relationship with his wife at home and, and those personal kinds of, of conflicts, which felt out of balance with the life or death of the entire world sort of thrills of the espionage. Okay, Hope, I wonder what you think about Cumberbatch's performance. I thought he was great, mm -hmm. you know, and he always is. I can't, I can't think of a single film of his that I, that I would think, oh, he was, you know, the weak link in that. I mean, he's an incredibly talented actor and very committed to each role. And I think that he really um, uh, brought some nuance to this idea of the salesman, right? That, that that's why uh, Greville was so attractive in this to, to the government because. Nobody was going to think that this guy was a spy. He was just a schmoozy salesman. And I think that that he did a great job of being somebody who really was misplaced in this environment, but in the end showed that he could handle it. Mm -hmm. And um, why was this movie made today? Do you think timing holds any sort of importance? I do. Um, and I think it almost always does. Uh, and, 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 you know, when it's a... Uh, uh, based on true events film, sometimes you think, well, maybe something was just recently declassified and that's why. But that's not really the case. You know, uh, Greville Wynn was kind of a public figure uh, until he died in 1990. So it really isn't that. I think that it's because the reason that Penkowski, the Soviet spy, was um, sort of encouraged to the, the, the reason he decided to share secrets with the world was because he felt that Khrushchev was an unhinged bully and had too much power and was likely to do something that couldn't be undone. And I feel like globally, that's not a very hard worry for us to recognize, especially over the last few years. Okay, so, I mean, you said spy films almost always hold a mirror to the politics of the time that they're made in. So uh, what would you say, what does this film say about the state world is in today? You know, I think that it is a hopeful, um, kind of a statement that no matter how overwhelmed you may feel with the decisions that your leaders are making, that it really is in the hands of each each person in each country to um, try to redirect your nation into you know and the world, you know, to do the things that you feel are the right things. And uh, and before we wrap up, I wonder, you know, especially after what you said. Do you think watching espionage movies uh, is generally an escapist thing to do? Because, you know, at the end of the day, they assure us that the struggles of our times uh, are going to be handled by these heroes that we sort of, you know, wish that we could be. I do think so. And I think that's one of the reasons why these everyman type struggles like this, like Bridge of Spies and like, you know, a lot of the old Hitchcock films where, where, where just some nobody is plucked into this wild world. I think that that's what it reflects. You know, it, it gives us to, to, to a chance to sort of dream. I could do that. I could be a part of that. Well, OK. Hope Madden, it was lovely having you with us today. Thanks a lot. Thank you.